So last week, the New York Times ran two preprint studies declaring the origin of COVID-19 has been solved and that it had begun in the QAnon market in Wuhan and was not accidentally leaked from a lab in the same city. Molecular biologist Alina Chan pointed out some red flags in the data and the Times reporting, tweeting, both natural and lab origin of COVID hypotheses are plausible and must be credibly investigated. It's normal for people to argue which is more likely, but we don't have the data to know. It's not okay for experts to report near certainty or dispositive evidence when there is none. Alina Chan is a molecular biologist specializing in gene therapy and cell engineering at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. She's also the co-author of Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19. She joins us now to discuss. Welcome. Thanks for having me. And so, yeah, what, what, did, what did you make of the New York Times article? We, we covered it, uh, when it when it first came out and kind of noticed that the top half of the article and the, and the bottom half of the article were in, in conflict with each other. The top half kind of affirmatively saying that, well, I guess this is over. It was interesting discussion, but we've solved this. And then the bottom half being uh, a whole bunch of scientists saying, uh, no, I actually don't think that this is over at all. Where do, so where do you come down? So I, I really wish this was over so we could all get back to our own lives. And I, I do think it's know, possible right? to find yeah. the origin. The problem is that we are just repeating what happened in 2020, which is a ton of reporters and scientists rushing <laughs> to print headlines that they found the origin of COVID-19, which couldn't be further from the truth. So if you look at the papers, which I've done now in detail, you see that there's actually no dispositive evidence in that. There's no incontrovertible evidence like the authors have claimed. So for me, this is just a replay of 2020. Yeah, right. That's what I I was taken by when I read uh, you know the, the headline of this New York Times story. It was this very bold claim. You know, it's solved. And then you read and like, well, we're not actually getting a lot of new information. Like, yes, there was definitely a super spreader event at this at this uh, this wet market. That that's certainly well established, and it's helpful to learn w with greater detail about it. But they, they still weren't you know finding the really clear evidence that it, it, it was the animals themselves there causing the infection rather than just someone who had already been infected, perhaps because of a lab leak or, so, or some other reason, who, who was at the, at, at the event. You know, may, you know, maybe th this was you know, more information. Maybe it, it puts a, a little, uh, you know, another, uh, puts more, more heavily weights the wet, marks, uh, wet market side of, of this. But it, it definitely doesn't establish that clear, that clear link, that obvious link right, that we're looking for. So I'll say this much. These authors have done really a large amount of work. And apparently across more than half a year, they've been working on putting together all of the circumstantial evidence that they can to support the natural origin of COVID-19. The problem is that none of these evidence capture the direct evidence that we found in the case of SARS-1 that happened about two decades ago. So in SARS-1, we found the animal host within two months of isolating the virus. and by we, I mean Chinese scientists. So they didn't need any Western help. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they themselves were smart enough, resourceful enough to go find the animal host. And not just that, but they found that there was strong antibody evidence of the animal trading community being exposed to SARS-like viruses on a regular basis, even before the SARS outbreak. In the case of SARS-2, all of that evidence is still missing. No animal host found, no, no evidence of SARS-like viruses circulating in uh, Wuhan prior to this outbreak. So for them to make this leap, and say that they have uh, found as much evidence for SARS-2 as they have for SARS-1, that's wrong. The, their main evidence seemed to be that ar around the place where there were some, what, the raccoon dog, a couple of raccoon dogs, uh, they found extra samples. Uh, and, they, and they actually found two variations of SARS-2 there, they said. And, and, and so the researchers like, well, it's, it's over. Can you explain that, that didn't strike me as meaning it was over. Can you explain why they think that that is so persuasive? So no one is disputing the fact that there was a cluster of COVID-19 at this Huanan seafood market, which sold some wild animals that are capable of being the intermediate host. The problem is that we have not found the typical signs of a natural spillover that you'd be looking for, such in, in the case of SARS-1. So just because you found the human version of the virus at the market, 
It doesn't tell you whether or not a human brought the virus into the market or whether an animal gave it to the human. So in the case of SARS-1, for example, we saw many animal versions of the virus. Before the virus jumps from an animal to a human, it's not already in the human adapted form. It's in the animal form of the virus. So there's no trace of that at all. The evidence that the authors discussed were collected in January 2020. So by this time, both variants that they're talking about had even made their way outside of that city. They've made their way across provinces in China by that time. And some even suspect that they, both variants that were found in the market by January had left China, had made its way across oceans. So it's, it's not surprising to me to see that both A and B variants are at that market. Right. It's not as if, so if you, if you then found out, okay, these raccoon dogs come from, were brought to Wuhan from this area of China, and we've gone there, and we've found, oh, look, here are, were all these sick raccoon dogs, right? Then you would say, okay, now we're getting somewhere. But, like, that is not at all what they're claiming here. They're just claiming some incidental, um, you know, sickness in this area, not that, like, this is what, they don't have any evidence to suggest so far that this is what brought it in. Like that would be a new breakthrough where we would, now we would really be starting to say, okay, it's pretty, you know, we're, we're getting there in terms of having this kind of settled. That's not at all what, what, they, what they were asserting here, right? Exactly. So th this is a, actually a very interesting point because uh, not just this preprint by Western scientists came out, but a similar preprint by the Chinese CDC came out a day before them. And using the same exact data, they reached completely opposite conclusions. The Chinese CDC said that the market was a human super spreader event and that they could not find any signs of an animal host, that none of the samples at the market uh, that tested positive, so these are environmental samples from tables, uh, doorknobs, that kind of thing, they could not find any correlation with the sale of wildlife. But the Western scientists in their preprint took the same data and reached completely opposite <laughs> right. conclusions. In fact, they said that it was dispositive and it was incontrovertible evidence that, that the virus had come from an animal and that the samples were correlated with wildlife sales. So for me, as a scientist, you just look at the data and, and the fact that two people can go off on, in such different directions means that the data is not enough to support these conclusions. It's and, and it's funny because if you just stepped back you would think that motivated reasoning would drive American and New York Times researchers to say, aha, it was the lab. Uh, and it would drive the Chinese CDC to say, aha, see, we told you it was just a human spreading event. But no, instead, they're, they're reversed in that situation. <laughs> um, and Alina, you've been following this so closely. This is related but unrelated. Robbie and I were talking about this the other day. We, you remember six months into the pandemic, we started getting a bunch of headlines about people saying that they had been infected with COVID in Italy kind of mm -hmm. prior to November, December. And then, and then mm -hmm. you'd see other articles. Were those false alarms? Uh, why haven't we heard more about that? Is, you know, w was it circulating before this? What's, what's your sense of what the timeline of the origin is separate from the kind of geo location? Yeah, so other scientists have studied this in great detail, and some of them put the origin, so the first human infection of this virus, as far back as September. But most of them will agree that it's within October to November. So I'd say there's some wriggle room there for, for when cases might have started in, in China or spread to other countries. So many of these studies that I've seen, they don't have very strong, uh, robust evidence. So what is needed there is for an external party, like maybe the World Health Organization, to go in and reproduce those studies. If they think that there's substance to these studies, reproduce them. Because that would, if we find evidence that there was you know, humans being ill before the Wuhan event, then we, it would suggest, right, that this jumped from animal to human before that, before that event. Is that, that's so right? Or, there's or an from expert the lab. at Yale, yeah. right. a, a or medical from the lab. expert. Right. Yeah, so there's a medical expert at Yale who said that it is known within his community that in December 2019, mid-December 2019, there were U.S. doctors on the ground in Wuhan, and that they had known about these uh, pneumonia cases even then in mid-December. Mm -hmm. So, my question is, why have they not been interviewed? Why, mm. why have these U.S. doctors not been asked? about what was happening in those early days of the outbreak, because it can give us so much more insight. Like when had they first heard of these cases? What was the connection there? Had they heard that the cases were from the market or not? 
And that, that would actually line up interestingly well if it was September or October, because Wuhan, and this is something people are learning about China, it, ha it has a dozen cities that are bigger than New York City that you've never even heard of before. And one of them now we've heard of is Wuhan. Uh, 20 plus million people, international airport, flights, you know, people are leaving to Italy constantly uh, from Wuhan. So if somebody, you know, happened to get sick in October, then they would have, you know, it's quite plausible that they'd be in Italy in October. And, and, why, and that's how you could have some of that spread. Um, who, could you connect us with uh, the person that knows some of those doctors? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to point them out to you. Yeah, that, that, would, that, that would be great. Um, so the, the main having, reason why yeah. I don't want to name them is because I don't yeah, yeah, think don't that na don't they name would them want here. to be <laughs> right, Don't, don't name them here. We'll, yeah. we'll talk to them and see if, they're, if yeah. they're comfortable talking. But you've been studying this so, you know, for so long. What, what's, what's, your, what's your best guess at this point? So I'd say that these preprints, at least the ones from the Western scientists, have put out their best bet. They have put together all of the circumstantial evidence they can for a natural origin, and I respect that. But I, I don't think that they should have gone so far as to launch a media campaign and to say that they found the origin. I think that's not scientific and not good at a time when we need public trust in science to be high. Uh, but on the other hand, there is a lot of circumstantial evidence for a lab origin as well. Uh, some of us might have heard of the uh, research proposal that was leaked in September last year that showed that scientists in Wuhan had a pipeline for research that would have directly led to the creation of viruses like SARS-CoV-2. So if you stack both sides of circumstantial evidence, there, there's a way to argue which one you think is more likely, but currently there's no dispositive evidence. So from my personal point of view, I think it's very striking that there was a research program that could have led to the emergence of SARS-CoV-2 in that exact city where the outbreak was first detected. But I can also understand how these scientists see the first cluster being detected in the market as being indicative of a natural origin. Yeah. But I, I'm glad that you brought up you know, the fact that we have not found the, an, the transfer animal. Uh, we don't have that, even though in, the, in SARS-1, we did find that in just, uh, and we, you know, chi the Chinese scientists found it, it, just, it was just two months. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're, it's years later now, and we haven't produced that, which is, that, you know, that's, a, that's the big piece of kind of, again, circumstantial evidence that really that, that keeps me tipping the other way. But. And last yeah. question for me, at least. But can you talk about the riskiness of this type of research? Because if it, let's say it did spill out from this research, when did that research start? In other words, did they have a 50-year track record and it was just unfortunate that uh, something went wrong? Uh, or are we talking that pretty quickly after they started doing this dangerous research, it would have spilled out if we accept, say, October-ish? 2019 as the as the moment. So let me paint this uh, picture for you. So after the first SARS outbreak, Chinese scientists were very quick to locate the source of this outbreak, and they did not cover up the source. They what they were covering up was the size of the outbreak because it was embarrassing to show how how large the outbreak had gotten. But they were very fast to share with the international community. Hey, we found the animal source. We found the antibody evidence. This happened within two months of them isolating the virus and knowing it was a coronavirus. That was the first time they had seen the SARS-like virus. So after that, a lot of Chinese scientists around the world really wanted to, to share in the glory. So there was a lab in Wuhan that used to study aquatic uh, viruses, viruses that infected crustaceans or shrimp. Uh, and this pivoted to do SARS-like research in Wuhan where there are no stars like viruses that, that have spillover potential. And so this lab has been doing this type of research for about two decades before the emergence of SARS-CoV-2. And their research program was expensive it, it, and involved a lot of international partners. Apparently, they were collecting thousands of animal and human samples across not just China, but seven Southeast Asian countries sent samples up all the way, more than a thousand miles up into central China to be studied. And in this lab, now we know that they were mixing and matching these viruses. They could just based on the sequence, create viruses, just generate them in the lab. Mm -hmm. So they didn't even need to grow them in the lab. They could just read the sequences and make them. And we found out that they were putting in novel genetic modifications that could have led to an enhanced pandemic pathogen. So. I really want to emphasize here that this work was well-intentioned. I'm not saying that there's a bioweapon. I'm not saying mm -hmm. that they did this to, to kill people or anything. Far from that, they were trying to inform 
and prevent pandemics. And it's very unfortunate that they're now in the situation where we have to investigate, we have to fairly and transparently investigate. So not making any assumptions that <laughs> what their motivations sure. were or, or whether they definitely did this or not, we just need to see their records and understand yeah. this so we can prevent the next pandemic. Uh, unquestionably, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Lena Chan, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me on the show. And we'll be back with more Rising right after this.